Ah, uh, hello my friends, hello my life warriors, wherever you are in the world, welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 219, I was very privileged to have Jennifer Peavy on the podcast. She is the principal at uh, Black Lab. She is also an author. Uh, her book is called Natural Reflectors. We talked about many things today. We talked about her book, her journey of like how basically how she got started with the book, uh, what she learned from the whole process. We also talked about about, yeah, uh, basically quelling that inner voice within, which sometimes is your greatest cheerleader, but sometimes your greatest opposition. But yeah, have to say it was a joy speaking to her uh, about many things, and I look forward to speaking to her again in the future. So please sit back, listen to the podcast, and enjoy the show. Yeah. Peace. <laughs> Here we go. Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 219, I'm very privileged to have ah, Jennifer Peavy on the podcast today. She's a principal at The Black Lab. Also, she is the author of Natural Reflectors as well. How are you, my lady? How are things? I am doing very well. It's been a fabulous start to the week and I'm glad to be here. Mm. One of the things I didn't mention in the intro, she is a mischief maker. She is <laughs> like her cat name. If she had one would be Captain Shenanigans. There I'm going to stick with it. Yes. <laughs> and I won't deny it. <laughs> hey, there you go. I like it. I'm sure friends and family would agree. That's like, mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That's like, only if I knew half the stories. Not even half. Only if I knew a quarter of the story. There you go. I'm not sure we have enough time. <laughs> That's a colorful past right there. <laughs> Maybe a colorful present. Who knows what the future holds. That's another story. Yeah. I have to say, yeah, you, like, how can I put it? You had decided to become an author when? Because it's like, yeah, corporate life, corporate life. And then like, yeah, I'm going to do a stint in academia. And now I'm an author. What on earth made you do this? Well, I never really set out to be an author, but I never set out to go back to academia. Uh, there are many things I didn't set out to do, but when the opportunity shows up, I, I tend to take it. Mm. And so I had left corporate burnt out. I did take a contract to feed myself um, in academia. And then at the end of that contract, I was giving myself a couple of months. In fact, that's the reason my company is the Black Lab, as I adopted a Black Labrador puppy and called it my paternity leave. Um, and so I spent a couple of months with her and was coming out of it and started trying to figure out what I was going to offer. Was I going to start a business? Was I going to go back to corporate? And then the pandemic happened. And so here I was unemployed and trying to figure out what I was going to do. And of course, that was not a, exactly a good time to be looking for something new. So I created a structure. I started working on it and I started, uh, I actually made a workbook and started looking or showing it to other people because I felt like I really had found something, particularly in the middle of the stress of the pandemic and started sharing it. And someone had told me to go to this one particular uh, publisher that's out of G uh, DC. It's called uh, New Degree Press. And it was a lot about people who've never done this before. And they told me, I said, well, really, you ought to do the book first. And so I went through the process with them. And like I said, it just kind of happened. I could join this class. I could join this cohort of about 200 people who are all writing books together instead of doing it all by ourselves. And I said, okay, here I am. Let's give it a try. Okay. Like, right. Just like, I'm right. Let me get on this course write a book with 200 other people around me yeah. as I, and yeah, go for it. So like, this is the thing. What would you say were some of the great challenges of like getting down with writing your first book? Well, I think a lot of it uh, was the fact that yes, it was a blank sheet of paper. What in the world was I going to fill this thing up with? You know, there was actually two parts. There was the first part was with a, a class, a institute, the Creator Institute that's associated with Georgetown. And in that class, you're creating the draft manuscript. And so the goal there was 25,000 words. 
And the nice thing was, is it was an iterative process. So we went through all sorts of classes about how to write stories, how to write little snippets. Mm -hmm. And then they did assign us to a development editor. So we were able to spend time with them. So to me, it was, I write a little prototype, I hand it to her, she gives me some feedback, and then it, I know better how to write the next one. It wasn't so much editing that one, but how do I write better? And then we would take those little Legos and create chapters. And then those chapters would then go together and hopefully be in some sort of argument order to be able to create the book itself. Now, I went into it with this idea of talking about what I had done during the pandemic. Yeah. And so I got to probably about 10, maybe 15,000 words. Now, these were huge Legos. There, there was no, nothing that went together because I can be verbose and I was all over the place. And we were, we were fine with it. But at some point, when you get a, a critical mass, then you need to fill out this document that says, well, what are you trying to do? Mm. What is your argument? What does all this mean? So it's kind of like, you know, put, putting a bunch of post-it notes up on the wall and a bunch of ideas. Well, now you need to start organizing them. Yeah. 15,000 words without focus at that point. Without focus. Exactly. So just get it all out like a uh -huh. big brain dump. And they came back to me and said, you know, Jennifer, you know, your journey is interesting, but if you would broaden the scope to include more people, or to make it more generalized. So what I was doing was talking about my personal process. Mm -hmm. So we ended up broadening to talk about how to develop a personal process. And so I had to throw out about 7,000 of those 15,000 <laughs> words. <laughs> They're in the ethernet somewhere <laughs> out there, but it was a matter of then, okay, so I took some of those large Legos and I was able to take pieces of them, but then I had to go find a bunch of new pieces. Um, so it went from maybe uh, 15 hours a week to maybe 30 hours a week of work that I was doing <laughs> on this one thing. And that lasted for about three months to be able to get to that 25,000 words. Now, fortunately, because of all of that, I had 40,000 words at the end of the draft manuscript. So I had a much bigger uh, pot of words to work with. Just once. reaching over by 15,000 words, just like, just, hey, well, hey but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but once we got into editing, it was like, okay, cut that, cut that, cut that. So, <laughs> it, you know, it's easier to cut things than it is to generate things. So that was one of the big issues. Um, another thing I learned about myself, though, was the... Um, the idea of creating the story and then creating the chapter and then creating the draft manuscript. When I got done with it, my editor looked at me and said, Jennifer, you've written a book. And, and I said, well, thank you. And then we hung up and we went on with life and she had given me some feedback. She said, one of your chapters is awfully heavy because we've already said I've, I've overshot. She said, it's really heavy, Jennifer. You probably should split it into three. And I had a couple of weeks before the official deadline. So I chose to spend the time splitting that one chapter into the three. Well, I had checked off the manuscript off my list. And when I started working on those other two chapters, there was something inside of me that started growling going, no, you were done. What are you doing now? And what I realized was I had not accepted the fact that I had reached a milestone. Even though she said, congratulations, you have written a book. I didn't accept it. Mm. And I realized that my definition of a complete book was what was printed in a hardbound copy that was at the bookstore. And I realized I had not celebrated the journey. I didn't celebrate each story. I did not celebrate the chapter. I didn't celebrate the manuscript. And that was one reason I was angry and growling is because it's just, oh my God, why are we not done again? And I found that not only with the book, but with, for me, that was a very good life lesson is I need to celebrate those little, uh, little, so little successes along the way yeah no i understand that but like this is the thing when like especially when you're doing something new like yeah. this which you haven't done ever before and when you've got all the time you can devote to a particular project if you're a heads down type person when your head is down you're just going for it just like okay right go 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 when you had that call, this is the moment where you should like take that breath. You're like, all you're doing is taking a breath. You're not actually like going, okay, where's your little victory dance at that precise moment in time? Like going, I've completed the book. 
All I need to do is just break this down into chapters. Piece of cake. No problem. Like you're just taking a breath and like, okay, you're back in it. And I- getting caught up in that, it's so easy. And like, so mm-hmm. like, especially when you got that whole drive and focus, so easy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and like you say, with it being new, everything felt a little out of control. You know, it, there was a certain amount of, I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. And everything was a surprise. And, and the nice thing was with the class and the, and the cohort and even with the publisher, they weren't trying to overwhelm us with too much at once. Mm. They would say, okay, you do this. And they might tell you three things. Uh, if there were 20 items that needed to be done, they'll tell you about three or five of them so that you can, you know, however much you could absorb and handle. But I often felt like I was just running amok. I had no idea what was going on. I, you know, I was getting things done. I wasn't sure what it was worth. Um, but, you know, in the end, I felt like, okay, I've done it. Um, we've got it all organized. We put it out in the world and and now we're seeing what happens with it. Ah, ah. So, <clears throat> With you completing the book, what was the sort of sensation you had when you actually had the finished article printed, bound, and in your hand? That guy, yes, this is a book. And like, yeah, with its little band going off to Congress, at the Library of Congress as well. Absolutely. So that was one of the things that it was nice to have uh, New Degree Press behind me because they said, film it. So exactly what you're saying is to, when you open the box and you get that first glimpse of the book, film it. So, because sometimes you just don't know in the moment. So um, boxes on the front porch, you know, we have UPS, put that all out there. And I had three or four boxes and I've got my camera all set up and I get out there and I cut it open. And that moment, it, it, it became very real. It, even though I had seen the ebook I, there are people who actually had already purchased the book off of Amazon and had it in their hand. I had a launch, a virtual launch party, and all these people had their books in hand <laughs> that they'd ordered on Amazon, and I hadn't seen it yet. <laughs> are you the second? That's my book. But to be able to open the box and not just one, but I had like over 200 copies that had been shipped to me directly because we had gone through a crowdsourcing campaign. And so I had backers that had purchased a copy and I needed to be able to, you know, bound the, or bind them up with their perks and then mail them off to them. So I had these 200 copies sitting here on the front porch, open it up and lift it up. And it was hard to really fully understand what I had, but it was a moment of tears. It was a moment of relief um, because it was real. Mm. And there was another moment just before. So you go through, uh, we went through the manuscript. We go through the uh, uh, revisions where we have beta readers that give you feedback on how it sits. and, and, And I had another editor that did that. Then you go through copy editing, which is about the spelling and the commas and the grammar and all of that. And then you go through proofreading, which that person, I guess, is just making sure everybody else was dealt with. Mm. Between each of those times, they would have us read the book out loud to ourselves. And before that proofreading one was the one time where I sat in one sitting and read the whole book. And I can remember at the end of the day, I was not only hoarse, but how it felt at that moment, because that was the first time I had read the entire book in order all the way through. And that's when it really started to feel like it was alive, because before it was all these little bits. And Mm -hmm. I might have been doing chapter nine yesterday, and then today was chapter two. And, you know, everything was scattered all over the place. Even though I'd had the outline in the very beginning, this was the first time of seeing all the work, all the little bits all lined up all the way through. And so that was another moment that was quite spectacular. And I can remember um, physically feeling a moment of relief. Like you said, breathing. Yeah. There was a moment my inside says, oh, there it is. Yep. I'm always curious about this factor because I've spoken to a number of people who have done books and it was like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, I've, I'm an author and everything like this. And like, I haven't really sort of 
ground down into the whole process because yeah. you go you had bits here and like bits there and I imagine like that chapter came to you here and then you're sort of slotting it in like you're the only person who's like you said I read my book from beginning to end and didn't put it down did it sort of like go oh okay like when you had it like fragmented and then putting it together did it kind of you thought it was going to make sense one way but it turned out to make sense a different way to you oh um yes absolutely and and it did it still made sense but yeah. i can tell you um i just finished doing the raw assets for the audiobook that'll be coming out later this year okay. and so therefore i read it again but in that case i read it out of order but what was interesting both times so these are probably 4 months apart these readings, I still learn something from my own writing. I'll go, oh yeah, Jennifer, you forgot that. You know, things that I'm saying and points that I'm making, it's very easy mm. to get busy because that's what the book is about, is about being busy and not uh, living what you really want and what is your heart's, being intentional about what your heart wants. And so many times I get distracted, which is one reason uh, that I needed the structure. And that's one reason I ended up writing the book was this idea of if not for anybody else, it's for me. And so it, maybe I didn't set out to set my own guide, but, but to your point of was something different. Yes, it was. It was a fact that this was teaching me just as much as anything else. Um, the other thing that I always laugh about is I'll go back and read something that I've written however long ago. And I go, wow, who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like who wrote that it was who like, wrote that that was actually like, good it's like, like hey you know what i would like to meet that author she yes. seems, like she seems like she's got her stuff together ah wow. yes i go yeah like you know what concise precise and yeah there is a certain degree of wisdom i can relate to Exactly. Mm -hmm. Who is she and where is she? <laughs> yeah. But it, it takes so many revisions. That, that was the beauty of this process is it's an iterative process. You can start off with something that's really bad. You okay. get to a mediocre manuscript and, and then you go through more iterations. So I went through seven different iterations. Wow. Now, yeah. So with all these iterations, the edits, like basically bringing together this fragmented book it like the fragments together into this book like yeah working uh like between 20 to 30 hours sorry 20 to 40 hours a day uh for a three month period yeah uh did it take you three months to get everything together or what how what was the eventual timeline from beginning to end so we started the the class part of it to make the manuscript in september and then we, and then it was, it was a lot of taking and making stories for a while before we actually got into forming chapters. Yes. So it was probably six weeks before we started forming chapters, probably another six weeks before we were actually saying, okay, do we have chapters that we like? Are they in the right order? Somewhere in between though, we created a, uh, a table of contents saying, okay, what would be the general flow? Mm. If I were to do this over going back corporate, I would have made a slide deck and I, and I wouldn't necessarily have written out the entire thing, but I would have said, what's the point? And what's the argument? Like if I were talking to you, it'd be a whole lot easier than my writing it down and saying, let me tell you about this idea. Mm. And then I would have, I would have had a thread that I would have followed, um, but neither here nor there. This is how it happened. And then we turned those in, um, in the middle of January to the, uh, to, to say, okay, here's our, our draft manuscript. And then that was uh, turned over to the publishing house who then had another editor that went through it and said, okay, what is she missing? Does she have, cause they were like five different elements to a chapter. It's very formulaic five different elements to a chapter. Mm. And did you have all of these elements? And uh, did you have everything that you said in your table of contents? So it was mostly great big table, check everything off um, type of thing. And the nice thing was with the, the extra words, I had all of my elements. There was one she felt was weak. And um, knowing my editor, I was, or she felt it was not there at all. And I, I looked at my editor, I said, there's no way my editor was very strict. <laughs> there's no way in the world I was missing anything. I know she had it in there. So 
it was interesting trying to understand what this person saw. Mm-hmm. And with my background as a designer, I spend lots of time, even though I've developed a product in this, in this case, it was my book. I'm always like, what do you see? You know, I have an intent, but the user or the reader has a different um, interpretation. And I want to make sure that I understand their interpretation and make sure that my message uh, deals with however they see things or how they navigate things. So that, that, that draft manuscript then, so that's September to January, we then got into a, um, uh, that editing campaign, uh, or not that campaign, but that editing round of what is missing, what's going on. Mm. We then went into the crowdsourcing campaign. And a lot of that was getting ready for it was, uh, so that was about two months. There was one month of getting ready for it. There was one month of running the campaign. And that was uh, money to produce the ebook, the paperback at the minimum. And then to be able to produce a hardback was another thousand. And then an audiobook was another two. Thousand. So depending upon what you wanted to do. So there was generating a video um, and they, they would ship us a, a lanyard and, and there all this introduction about how to set up your phones and all of this and how to get the right space and what you need to say and all these forms to fill out so that you may have a promotional video that would go on your Indiegogo campaign page. And then your story, you know, getting all that right. Um, and then going into the marketing camp or getting going into Indiegogo campaign, which then also needed to have a social media campaign. So there was a lot of that getting ready um, between January and then the end of April. So because they had a 30 day campaign. If you, and you could extend it if you wanted to, but generally the audience gets really tired beyond 30 days. Mm. And then when that is over, then we get into those revisions. So hopefully during that time period, you've received backers. Uh, that that want to be a part of the journey and would like to read the the manuscript and help you edit it uh, type of thing. And generally, you hopefully get about three to 10 people that would be willing to to dive into this mediocre manuscript and help you with that. (laughs) Um, And so you identify those. And so you're you had that your editor has read through it then these uh, beta breeders have read through it and then you make revisions based on that. So there are three different revisions within that time period. Um, That would probably be until May, end of May, probably another two months. Mm -hmm. At that point, then we go into copy editing and proofreading and they, they were very big about the fact, okay, you submit it. It's going to last two weeks because they wanted to flip things around very quickly. Cause at this point, that's all about, um, commas and citations and that type of thing being right. Oh, and I forgot though, during all of this prior to the Indiegogo campaign, you're also working on your cover. So we're working with a graphic designer within the publisher and, and uh, making general sketches to them, trying to communicate what we want the, co- the cover to say or to do or to communicate. And then they're making prototypes of that and you get like three or five of those and, and we interact with them on, on how that goes. Being a designer myself, I was probably a real pain <laughs> with that. It's, it's like, no, it's got to look like this. No. Well, or I could run Photoshop and I was like, no, 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 I want, can, can you do this filter? Can you, you know, all of that type of stuff. So, um, so we get to the cover because that's part of the, the campaign is being able to show the cover. Um, so then we, then at the point that everything has gone to publication. Oh, and then we also have the layout, the interior design of it. So where do you want quotes? What do you want bolded? What do you want in italics? Um, What do you want indented? Like if you want to pull something out and and make it bigger, that type of thing. So we go through that as well. Mm. And then the publisher would go through and generate all the files that are necessary. And because of um, on-demand printing now, it's very different that I actually own all the assets in this particular case because it's a hybrid publisher, even though we did the fundraising and they have all the, the people and the talent to help me. Yes. Um, we go through, uh, I, I actually own everything, which also means I have to do the marketing and I have to do, I have to do everything, do all the marketing, be able to, to and, and fortunately with Amazon, they do all the distribution or at least 50% of the distribution for the world goes through Amazon for books. So the publisher uh, generates the files And then we would generate our own accounts with Amazon. And then in our case was with Kobo. That's part of Rakuten. 
And for us uh, in the US, that's part of Walmart. Um, and then Ingram Spark was our particular uh, printer for anybody else. So Barnes and Noble, any other bookstore in the world could go through Ingram Spark to be able to pick up that book. So that's all those files have to be generated. And for each one of those, it's a different set of files and different formats. And fortunately, the publisher knows all of that. I'll, I kept thinking every time we went through this is I would never have had the energy to figure all this out because <laughs> they're like five pages in Amazon to fill all this out. And, he, and we had this nice video that said, click yes, click no. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. <laughs> yeah, because like this is the thing, like the reason like, I'm like very curious because going down this sort of rabbit hole, it's one of those things where, okay, a year ago you had none of these skills. A year ago, you never would think to put yourself into this realm of yeah. discomfort. And uh, like with, like you go, oh, I want to produce a book. It has a hockey uh, stick like learning curve yes. to it. It's like, la, 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 woo. And it's like, which is quite mental because look, like basically paid like design, you're like, yes, I know design, but it's a case of, you know, design on this plane, but you have exactly. no idea about design on that plane. Exactly. And what you're trying to get involved in is like, they're mostly looking at you like, look, I, look, if I want you to, to design this for me, I'll come to you, but I know what I'm doing. Please back up. <laughs> Is that... Exactly. But then to go into when you're going through producing the book, doing all of this, uh, coming into the whole realm of then now, yeah, now marketing. Okay. I don't know. I don't know about you, but like, are you a, would you call yourself a strong marketer? I, I would say a beginning marketer. I don't know about being strong or not. I, I have grown a great deal in that. I, I did have an Instagram account and a LinkedIn account prior to this. Right. That was it. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm, you know, they, they tell us um, be present on everything and be strong on at least one. So I've stuck with Instagram because I knew the platform really well. Mm. Um, I've now got myself up to 4,300 followers um, on there, um, which I had a little over 2,000 on LinkedIn before, and I'm pretty much staying there, which is perfectly fine. Um, but that's one campaign. It, but then there's press media there's getting on television, there's getting into the newspaper, there's podcasts like this as a part of marketing, uh, being able to figure out uh, how to get reviews, mm -hmm. because reviews really drive the algorithm on Amazon. And it's not like you can just go and, oh, a bunch of authors trade. No, that's not right. We got to have honest interviews. So you've got to get you know people out of nowhere, so to speak. And, and the first is your backers. The people who bought the book that, that did the Indiegogo campaign, those are an e easy source. Um, the problem is only 25% of people who buy a book actually read it. <laughs> and, you know, to get a review, you need somebody to read the book. So it, it can become an issue. Absolutely. Um, I would say I'm a better marketer than I was a year ago. Um, because I could say I've also, because of all of this, I've become confident enough to open my own Airbnb. So I've now branched out into a different type of entrepreneurship and I'm like, I know how to market this, you know, and it's nice to have the Airbnb website that, that links me up with people. But now I've got an Instagram and a Facebook account and, and all of that and a Twitter account. So it, it's, it's increased my confidence to try new things, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for myself. Yeah, no, because like this is the thing I would say with regards to all what's gone on over the last, well, like two years, like this is the yep. thing. There are a number of people which, okay, when you've had no time to do anything, when you've been on that sort of hamster, hamster wheel of just go, go, yep. go, 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 and you get all of a sudden your time back at sometimes like yes having that sort of moment to sort of like breathe and really sort of have that like opportunity to reflect can right. be quite daunting for people and yeah. like this is the thing trying like 
not even trying to fill that time, but really sort of like having that opportunity to take stock of who they yeah. are is sometimes a very difficult thing to do indeed. Right. For yourself, you've like become this sort of, how can I say, a, one of the sort of few prime examples of like going, yeah, okay, I've got my time. I, What do I do with this time? Yeah. Um, do I just go back, try to get that nine to five? which quite hard back in 2020, let's just say. Uh, Do I just sit back? Okay, okay, I've got an unemployment check coming my way. Right. You know what? Many people took that option. Or do I actually strike out and see where I can, what I can do new for myself, where I can grow to? And like that is a very sort of, I would say rare thing. I know there is the great resignation, which is going on around the globe where people are like, oh, nah, I'm, I'm done with this. I want to make that change. Like, yeah. what would you say, like, for yourself who's made some changes from all, like mm-hmm. basically corporate, author, now Airbnb host and like then some. Uh, yeah. What would you sort of like advise people which might be sort of getting that sort of air of enlightenment uh, for change right now? I, I think for me, the, the biggest shift in mindset that I had, uh, put, and this is a lot of where I went through in 2020, because this would nag me, <clears throat> is I needed to save myself in a way, mm. you know, instead of, oh, I'm going to go get a job. And yes, it would be easy, but then I would be a slave to whatever they wanted or needed. And that was one reason I left corporate burnout is because, you know, I was growing and I wanted to grow in a certain way. And they were like, no, 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 this is what we need. So I think some of it is to, to realize that you are going to be the solution provider, even if you do choose to go back to corporate, it, it, but it goes to being a choice as opposed Mm. to, I have to do it. And I think that shift in mindset helps a great deal. Um, The one thing that helped me a great deal over the, the 2020 and some of 2021 was in my structure, I would have small wins. And then in celebrating those small wins, I was able to, in a way, document process. And it may just, it may not have been written down, but I'm able to point to things that I did that. I succeeded at that. And then therefore I was increasing my self-trust because when you're trying these new things out on your own, you know, you need to have a certain amount of trust because it's lonely. I, you know, all of my friends that are in corporate, just look at me. Don't say a word. I mean, they think I'm insane. Why in the world would you do something like this? And many of them aren't really sure about keeping up with me because I don't know if it makes them feel uncomfortable or if they're just too busy, you know, with everything that they've got going on, but there's not really many people you can talk to about what you're doing. Mm. And so I would spend a lot of time creating cycles where I would think about what I want to do, set a dream, make an intent. I would act on it. And then I would take a moment to go, well, how did it go? Mm. And part of that fulfilling cycle would allow me to develop my self-trust. And then being able to increase my self-trust would make me braver and give me more courage for the next new thing that I wanted to try. Even if it was just listening to what I wanted. Because sometimes, you know, if I, if you actually hear what you really want, you might have to do something about it. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that what that was part, those were two main things. Um, And then, I mean, third is be gentle with yourself. I know I spent a lot of time, I had, I had been brought up and been taught that I needed to have a corporate job and this is what I was supposed to do and to do anything different. I I had a voice inside of my head that would panic a lot going, what are you doing? What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to pay for that? I'm four years into it and nothing's been foreclosed. I'm doing good, you know, and it's amazing to me. And I have to keep telling myself that, okay, you've made it one more day. Mm. Part of that, I guess that one day is building that self-trust, all those cycles is I would focus a lot on as a metaphor, building a brick wall. And you got this huge brick wall, but today all I'm worried about is that one brick and that little bite breaking down big projects or big dreams and the small bites makes it achievable because I can handle that one little bite. And even if I lay that brick wrong, you know, tomorrow I can take it out. It's just one brick that needs to be fixed. It's not the whole wall. But again, in that reflection, I'm able to move back and see the whole wall and say, hey, look, I'm making progress. 
and that encourages me. So small steps, look at the big picture, you know, come in and come out. I, I think there's a lot to that, that, that can keep you going and, and help stave off burnout. I agree. Like one of the things when you say, yes, you look like friends from your sort of corporate world look upon you and went, mm, are you crazy? It, like there are, there is going to be a percentage of people which will look upon you and go, yeah, you're crazy for doing what you're doing. And like, this is the other thing, like there are like the other type of people, which will like the people who admire you for what you do, like they will, they always kind of do it in silence. They'll never say it to your face but the other group which like oh no you shouldn't do that where it's coming from a sort of realm of i would say like fear and disappointment in their sort of own achievements in their own yeah. life because it's like a case of if you're stepping into the light and like actually going for it then that spot like that part of that light sometimes shines upon like some of the things they're doing in their lives and you kind of like go uh what excuse are you looking to right now look don't get me wrong there are yep we have all got responsibilities in life yep. like yep. it might go i need to like go have these economic responsibilities i've got family i've got this and you can list out a myriad of excuses but in your heart of hearts you know you're doing something which is slowly killing you bit by bit you got to remember you always have a choice yep. whether you stay or whether you make a change. And I don't think people like that fact. It's like a case of I'm imprisoned in this, but are you? Yep. Yeah. Busyness and the burnout and all, it's like a badge of honor. Mm. It's almost like, Hey, look, I'm important because I'm busy. And, and as you say, having to let that go is a big deal. Yeah. Or it's a choice that you're doing it that way. Mm. But like, this is a thing you can be busy, but it doesn't mean you're being productive. Yes. Yes. In fact, there was a, um, Larry Kim, um, he's the CEO of monkey maker just put out an article yesterday, um, in ink. And it's this wonderful graphic. I threw it up on my um, Instagram page and I've gotten a lot of likes on it, but the difference between being productive and being busy and he talked about the idea of productive unicorns, which I guess he's implying very few of us are productive as opposed to a busy donkey. Mm. And, and saying things like knowing what you want, you have a mission, being able to um, focus on a few tasks, you have a few priorities as opposed to many priorities. You delay saying yes to things because you're gonna consider whether it fits in with what you're doing. You wish for other people to be effective, but busy people want other people to be busy. So going back to that idea you were saying about, I don't like people being different than me. I want everybody to be in the same burnout hell that I'm in, you know, <laughs> therefore we're all the same. Um, but it's very interesting. Yeah. Saying there is a difference between busyness and productive. And, and I like to say that the busyness is a choice. Mm. It doesn't mean that we aren't busy. It's not being active and lazy. It's the fact of being intentional so that what you're working on has meaning to you and is getting you where you want to go. I mean, ultimately, I think my mission in a way was I wanted to have a um, small business in my retirement. Now I've got my corporate 401k and I've got all of that and I'm, I'm happy with it and it's good, but I wanted a small mad money business. And so I felt like, I had this little bit of time where I could build that up before I retire and then, you know, kind of let it run, maybe not completely passively, but more passively than it would be if I started when I was 60. Wow, mad money, a uh, mad money. Mad fund. money. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, like, I'm, I hope you're not going to go into the US Mint and like, like steal lots of money. No. From there. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Like the film, <laughs> mad money. But, exactly, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but like this is the thing. Retirement is like a distant, a long distant way from you. So yeah, I, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. But like this is the thing. When you mentioned the sort of, yeah, the brick, like, yeah, putting that, laying that one perfect brick. Like Will Smith also comes to mind when he talks about it as well. But like this is the thing. I, when it comes to making a change in your life, 
if you just con like people like oh yeah to make a change you need to do something drastic big and stuff like this but all it takes is just consistently working on like just getting making yesterday working so you are two percent better than you were yesterday and when you do that enough times you go oh yeah 10 days have gone by yeah you're 20 percent yep. better and like yep. even if you fall back a little and you come back yep. you carry on you do that for a hundred days and you're like oh, oh yeah absolutely you are in a better place than you were a hundred days ago it comes yep. down to just focusing up and like yeah putting like putting together the work it might not be a sort of like focused coherent plan like i'm going to do a book but it might right. be a case of okay i have poor finances okay yeah. what can i do okay like here in the uk we get paid once a month i, I think in america it's like every sort of two weeks uh, it, it depends upon your job but yes yeah. yes but like this is the thing if it's a case of like okay like in a hundred days okay that's going to be at least three paychecks yep in the uk so like okay so if you put 200 aside to like pay down a credit card bill or like put mm -hmm. that towards the saving by the end of that like three months you are going to be 600 like 600 dollars like well 600 pounds down on your debt or yep. 600 pounds up on your savings right 600 which right. you can have yep. days ago, you know? Yep. There, there is a, um, a mean visual that always helps me, this idea of climbing a ladder. Mm. And if the rungs are closer together, it's much easier to climb the ladder. If the rungs are beyond mm. your reach, yeah. you can't get started. So it's your idea of saying this little bit every day or a little bit regularly, whatever that regularly is, mm adds up because you can get up the ladder because the rungs are closer. It's, it's achievable as opposed to something that's just too far away. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, this is the thing. One of the things with regards to something like we are the constant in the equation of our lives, yep. Not like outside forces come and go. You like, Oh yeah. But like, ah, uh, this person I've been with has done me wrong. It's like, okay, look, yeah, that person came along when in your life? Okay, right. And that person's gone out of your life. Mm -hmm. Now you at your thoughts and like, yeah, your shadow are going to be with you until you like move away, like shuffle off this mortal coil. Yep. But you are the constant and like, yeah, making those choices to be responsible for your life is some of the some sometimes the most scary things you can do but you need to do it to really sort of like not achieve greatness but just get that a little bit closer to what you might consider yep. achievement happiness like yep. maybe a little bit of joy you know yep absolutely and that was something while I was writing the book I mean I I have a designer background I would love to be an artist so I have yeah. a, a lot of chaos in the way I do things but with the book, I had to seriously think because of the newness of it, I had to seriously think about when and how do I do my best work? Mm. And it was get it done first thing. And they even advised us two hours was about how long your brain could handle focusing on this one thing. Don't, don't think you're going to do eight hours straight. You're going to have to take a break <clears throat> at about an hour and a half to two hours. And so I set aside two hours, at least five days a week. First thing. So I was bright. I was on, I was able to handle it. Now, by the end of it, I was pretty exhausted, but like you say, two hours every day added up very well. The other thing about it is I could look back and I could be calm because I could see I'm on time. Things are happening. And I learned it take, it would take me about a week to do a chapter. So when she had told me to separate that one chapter into three, I had two weeks. Hey, I can do that. Mm. Because I could see I, it was reasonable for me to plan because I knew myself on how on when I worked best. And I, th I think that's part of the reflection time is when do you work best? What do you do best? And then make sure you organize your life in such a way that you maximize on that. Mm. Would you say you found like a slightly different version of yourself with this process? 
I, I think so. And, and it's funny, uh, we were talking about Harry Turner that was on your podcast earlier, and I was on when Harry met Daphne and they were talking about, oh, how structured and I understand. I said, no, I'm a chaotic person. <laughs> I didn't get that at all from you, from your- Yeah, yeah, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I'm a highly chaotic person, but the, the, the structure, but the problem is while I'm chaotic, it wasn't producing anything. Mm. Yeah, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ideas and lots of starts and nothing finishing or very few things finishing. And the structure allowed me to choose ideas better, choose which ideas inspired me the most, allowed me to dream of what I wanted those ideas to get me to. And the structure allowed me to actually do it. Now I have to actually put in chaotic time because that's just part of who I am. <laughs> I can't walk away from being chaotic. I am happiest when I'm, you know, in the studio doing whatever I want to do. Mischief people, mischief. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But you know, that's, that's part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just say, okay, this is part of, part of that little child that needs to run around and be crazy. <laughs> Love it. Love it. <laughs> So with all of this, like, yes, the book, the like Airbnb, like, yes, yep. your business, like, yes, I guess you're rather noble looking Labrador, which I have yes, seen yes. on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> ah, you're even trying to get that dog to sell books for you. I've seen you. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Like, so with this, like, what sort of direction do you want the journey of, yeah, your life to go next? Because like, yeah, it seems like you are like breaking down into new realms and new chapters of your life in epic ways. Absolutely. And, and I, I feel I'm still in transition, but I'm feeling a lot more stability right now. I, I really, you know, income this year, I have income, which is really nice. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> To be able to um, refine what I'm working on. And it's not that everything that I have in my life, I have chosen. Yeah. But I would also like to create more free space within my life. Um, more time to, for that chaotic time, more time to savor what is going on. And I wouldn't say that I'm busy, but I am working. There's a lot of bricks being laid. And part of that is, you know, I've already gone through a corporate and I've already gone through all this. And now I'm building this thing. It'd be different if I had started this in my twenties and, and now could enjoy things more. Um, but I'd like to start putting parts together right now. I have a lot of separate things that I've been trying. I've been fishing, so to speak. Okay. So like, for example, you can sell anything through an Airbnb. You can sell the sheets on the bed. You can sell the furniture. You get. So I want to start making artwork and putting them on the walls, you know, and they are available. I don't know if they'll sell or not, but at least it's something that I'm able to say, okay, I am making artwork and I'm putting it. So that kind of thing of putting those things together. There's also the fact that I need to maintain the house. And so, you know, I'm hoping the Airbnb is going to help me put a fire pit in that I could enjoy and have some of my own downtime type of thing. <laughs> and I actually carve out some of that. Um, I'd like to be able to, um, going back to that, having that retirement income, having things set up in such a way that at least half of it runs on its own. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't mind putting in good work, but I'm not very good at maintenance. And so if I can find a way to let things kind of naturally, or I just pop them once a month and they keep spinning, um, I can see that things happening that way. Right. Because like, this is the thing, like when you say, yeah, run it itself, it feels like, and with regards to having things separate, it feels like you are going, you're, you're gearing up uh, to some next level rather than sort of like, I'm, ah, oh, yeah, maybe I should slow down. You're really sort of like, yeah, building. I'm not too sure what that eventual catalyst might be to sort of like thrust you onto that next level. But, yeah. yeah, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure either. I'm, I am in a place where I am going where the energy mm. is. So I'm, I'm waiting to see, or not waiting. I'm watching where thing where people respond, where things happen. I'm watching and, and observing my energy level, uh -huh. how much, how much am I attracted to what's happening? And, and is it something that I want to do more of? Um, type of thing. 
Um, and then what kinds of things do I want to outsource? But for right now, I have to do them. Like I clean the Airbnb. Mm. It's not something I necessarily enjoy, but it, it happens often enough. It's actually quite easy because it stays clean basically. But, you know, I'd like to outsource that type of thing. And then what would I um, free up space to be able to go somewhere else and, and do something else? Right. So you're trying to win back as much time as possible. Uh, so you can like put like direct that time into, well, probably relationships and yeah. Mm, I see. So with like, with your, with, how can I say your impish and chaotic nature? Like, yeah. So with you becoming a little bit more like focused, your impish self, uh, the chaos side of you, like, what is, like, when you're unleashed, what is, what is fun for you? What is the thing what drives you on that side of things? Yeah, I love to make, and, um, and, and you know, there's not a whole lot of money in making, and that's the problem. <laughs> uh, you so, know what, I will disagree, I'll push back on you on that. Okay, but, good. But there is, like, it's a case of, if this was, okay, 20 years ago, yeah, yeah you're right. There, it, there wouldn't, it takes a lot of hard work. You need to get into a store. You need to do that. Yep. But with like, say, print on demand services, yep. that you've used and stuff like this, yep. there is definitely much more of an opportunity. Like, yeah, you might have to work hard on building yep. that community, which like, uh, like, which, so into you that like yeah bam I, like i don't know if you heard the whole thing of a hundred like no sorry a thousand true fans yes 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 like, so yeah building with a hundred like a thousand true fans like if you get in, like if you're producing a hundred dollars of this that that's your hundred thousand dollar income exactly. right there so exactly. like yeah um, that, so I'll like, yeah, sorry to interrupt you like that. No, but, no, 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 you're good. You're good. No, no. And that's very true. They even told us with the books. Yeah. It was first because I used, um, uh, Taylor Swift mm. and how she started her career and her manager told her is she, that was that thousand true fans as she needed to shake a thousand people's hands. And that was one reason she exploded so much is that she personally spoke to people and those people became, you know, followers of hers. And so that's why they kept telling us to do the exact same thing. Um, so yeah, making and, and creating. And part of that is that design aspect of what I want to make and what I end up doing that really excites me. And, yeah. and I enjoy figuring out how to make it. How do I get the effect that I want? How do I, you know, how do I put these materials together and make that happen? Which is a whole separate thing than the actual making itself. Um, so sometimes I have to rely on uh, making processes that I already know. So for example, I do a lot with fibers because it's easy. You know, I, I know yarn, I know sewing, but if I want to get into wood and metal and welding, you know, it takes a little more practice for me to get into that. Um, but, but for me, there's this magical moment when I take all the chaos. Now, yarn is a really good one. Just think about this ball. I'm not a ball of yarn, just a pile of yarn <laughs> that is just chaotic all over the place. And then I do tapestry weaving. And so there's a moment where I, I've stopped for the day and I grab the edges of the fabric and I can feel the strength of it, that I took that chaos that I, that I love and I enjoy and I made order out of it. Mm. And I made structure out of it. And I made something that somebody else could understand. And I think that's a lot of what I like to do is translate that chaos into something that's useful to somebody else. But that, that moment I grab it and can feel it, that it's tangible. It's, it's, a, it's a magical moment for me. Yeah, like this is the thing, right? I, I, I so picture you now just having this like, okay, okay, I've got my Airbnb <laughs> and about like about, about five, 10 miles down the road, I've got this massive workshop where I've got everything <laughs> there. We're like, yeah, like a lathe, like welding. <laughs> Do you have the, that already? Mm. I have access to all of that. <laughs> I don't own it. And <laughs> I, I aspire to be a millennial and I don't need to own it. <laughs> I, I was like, 
I have access to all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. How did I know? <laughs> and those are my favorite days when I can go over to the shop because there are other people there who also know things. And that's always fun too. Right. Hey, God in heaven. So <laughs> well, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> no, no. It's no. Hilarious. So, <laughs> so let me see. Like, what is a piece a piece of artwork you're working on now? Well, right now I am working on a weaving uh -huh. um, that what I was doing uh, in my cycle. So that, that, that reflection and then action and then reflecting again, mm -hmm. um, I would also then once a season review all three of those and go, am I still happy with the way things are going? The, yeah. the, the more major trajectory. And each of those seasons, I would spend at the end of it, just at some downtime thanking myself for taking the time to do this and I would weave. And so my intent was, is to have a piece for 2021. Well, I didn't get it all done. So I've got about three inches left and that's, that's what I'm working on right now. And, and it's um, made from yarn that I collected from uh, Peru, Ireland, and New Zealand on three different trips. And so I have these uh, splotches of color, um, like Peru is all purple. Uh, everything from New Zealand is natural because all of the yarn I got there was uh, here's a Romney brown and here's the the merino uh, white and all of that. And then all my Irish stuff is green, of course. And so then these areas that repeat in the pattern um, represent those countries. And so I'll be able to, you know, if somebody asks if they come and see the piece, I can tell them, well, this is yarn from such and such. And uh -huh. Uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have to ask, like the images yep. behind you, like, yep. yeah, did you make those or did I, you? I did, I did. So it is, um, it's string art. And so there are 50 of those and you can see the nails. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so it's just thread in between, try to get it where the camera is so you can see. Yeah. It. Yeah, okay. yeah. 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 And um, so this was part of my 2022 because I've always wanted to be a working artist. So part of it was, okay, I made these to say, okay, what would my process be so that I could be efficient um, if I were to sell these on Etsy? And all of these are ones that um, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't, I mean, this is not necessarily an original design. So a lot of these I was knocking off on, on other things that I saw on the internet. And what my hope was then to do another 50, that it would be, I designed them and they're completely unique, but it was little things like, I, I didn't want the nails to be seen. Yeah. I, so I wanted them to be black with the black fabric. And then all you would see is the white thread. And so I spent a lot of time going, okay, do I want to paint the nails? Well, then I have to wait for them to dry. And then I could buy painted nails. Well, those were expensive. And so I was able to get a very simple steel nail. And this is going back to my engineering background. And I would heat treat them and make them a really, really dark blue. So they're not black, but they're really, really dark. And that's what I wanted. And then, and then I would oil treat them so that they would stay. But, but yeah. Right. What I'd simply say is like, yeah, if you sell those in, the, like, if you sell stuff like that individually, uh, like either on a larger scale, but also what I'd simply say is if you've got a person who can really do a close up for, like picture of it, so you yep. can like perhaps put it on a t-shirt or a hoodie or something like that. That's yeah. also another thing you could do with it as well. Yeah, I haven't thought about merchandising. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I make mean, yeah, great on tote bags and yeah, hats and yeah, we could ball caps here in the U.S. Yeah, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, a number Ooh, of on the top of the ball cap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. see the chaos <laughs> yeah well yes yeah, i can see like i i'm beginning to see your process uh, coming <laughs> to life yeah and it's like mm, this that mm. so yeah. with this being your like is this your first book of many or is this a case of yeah I'm, i've done one book gonna see how it is and then basically if the journey keeps me like going I'm going to continue or that's something I've notch on the belt. 
Well, I, I, it's that, that middle one of, I, you know, I didn't set out to be an author, so it's not like it's a dream come true. It's not a, I, I'm very glad that I did it. Yeah. Um, my original was to put out a workbook. Huh. So um, what my goal on this year actually is I'm taking my handwritten scribble workbook and I'm trying to make it a lot more um, uh, refined, uh, at least digitizing it. And I'm trying to make it a little more official. In 2020, I had a uh, monthly structure. And then in 2021, I looked at an annual structure with that monthly structure running within it. Mm. And so this year, then I'm trying, you know, since I tried out the annual and I'm coming back going, oh, I like this. I didn't like this. This worked or whatever. This year I'm trying to then, okay, I understand this a little bit better now. Let me digitize that. So sometime throughout this year, my hope is to um, offer a workbook. And I've actually started that. I offered a journal. I took a, a, I made a matching journal to the book. It's just plain paper. But again, those little rungs on the ladder I, I figured out, okay, I generated the files as opposed to the publisher. So I generated the files, I generated the cover and generated the interior. So I was like, okay, I've done that. So now I know how to interact with Amazon. So check that off. So now this would be more, what kind of content would I want to put in the middle and um, see how that works. Right. Yeah. yeah, I see. I see. Now, this is a question that's just popped into my head. Now, would you describe yourself as an entrepreneur or a Renaissance woman? Oh, I, I definitely would go Renaissance. I just like that better. Because <laughs> <laughs> I do. I love learning new things. I'm a yeah. bit of an info junkie. And I'm really into how. I've, I've had a number of people that, that have read books on Da Vinci and go, you know, you think a lot like him. So I, I definitely go that way. Um, the idea of the entrepreneur with the hustle and, and the focus on the money and the business, or at least that's the stereotype. I think there's a new set of entrepreneurs coming out, particularly with Gen Z coming out, that's going to be a bit different. But the typical Silicon Valley entrepreneur, no. Yeah, that's not me at all. I think that's one reason I avoided ever having my own business was I just I was like, no, that's not me. Um, mm. So yeah, no, definitely on the Renaissance side. Yeah, I'll try it. I may not keep it. I may not keep whatever it is I learned, but I, I'll definitely try it. Uh, this is the thing. I, I just feel like you're like you've tried your hand at everything. Now put it this way, like yes, all you need to do is a little bit of photography and I like film. You'll be like sort of emulating some parts of Maya Angelou's life as well. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I've done the photography, but I've done the video editing. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Like would be YouTuber in the effect. I, I hear that. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Ah, brilliant. Like this, I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, it's just, it kind of blows my mind because you are doing uh, quite a lot of things. And like, yeah, it's, I would say it's not unfocused. And going back to earlier, you're not just keeping yourself busy, you're being productive. And yeah. that's the whole thing. Like, that's one of the things I don't think people understand at times. It's like, oh, they go, how come you're doing so much? Yet so, like, and it's like, don't you doing this? You're doing that. You're doing this. And it's like going, well, yeah, you, it seems like you're doing a lot, but you kind of like got, okay, I've got three baskets of things I'm doing yep. and I'm going to make sure I do like these well. And it's not like 10 baskets where it's like all yep. scattered around. But that's yep. the whole thing. But when you're producing from these baskets, yeah, you might produce X amount of things, which to the world is like, oh my God, you're producing so much, but you're only focusing on three things. I'm sorry if I've yeah. broken the illusion or anything like this. No, 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 you're exactly right. It's interesting right now, at least for January, because mm. I, I spend... With this annual process, I spend the winter getting ready for the year. So January for me is about dreaming. Oh. So I'm a little unfocused about what I'm working on. So it's kind of things, okay, I would like to do this. But one of the things that I already do is I, I do a little bit of doodling as a, a set of, as a way of meditating. Because mm -hmm. I want to meditate. I like to sketch. 
And it's this one thing called Zentangle, which is basically little lines and you create these shapes and you just repeat them over and over and over for a time, for a section. And I like to do this before I go to sleep because it is very meditative and it clears my head. And then I'm out like a light afterward. Well, one of the things I've thought was I would take those Zentangles patterns and I would make them journal covers. Now that I know how to make a journal <laughs> and I could offer more journals on Amazon. So I'm kind of taking things that I do already and I'm moving them or I am structuring them in such a way that I can use them somewhere else. So like you say, there are only three baskets and it may look like, oh, you're making a journal too. Well, I'm already doing this meditative sketching thing. All I have to do is sketch it and up, I mean, uh, scan it and then upload it to create and then upload it to Amazon for this journal. And there's, there's a little bit of passive income. Mm. So okay. I, I'm looking at things that I do already and seeing, is there a way that I can just, you know, pivot a little bit and make it useful in another way? Yeah. This is the thing. Like, would you say any of this sort of full process, this formulation would have happened if it wasn't for like the dreaded 2020? No, no. Because I, I can tell you, I was, um, nudged a lot during my life, at least annually, if not, you know, every three to five years, there'd be this nudge of something needs to change or something needs to happen. And there were even times that I would find moments of reflection, but then something might happen. A new project would come or a move would happen and my world would get distracted and you got to focus on, you know, getting, getting the furniture in the room or whatever it is. And I think not only the, the pandemic itself, but the fact of how long it was. Yeah. That there was not only time to think about this, there was time to implement it. There was time for me to deal with that interior voice that says, you can't get away with this. There is no way in the world you can go on another month doing this. You have got to figure something else out. And I was able to, there was long enough for me to say, I've made it a year. And, and now she doesn't argue anymore. She's like, yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. I was able to prove it. I was able to spend time with her and, and ask her, well, why, why are you so scared? What is it that you're scared of? Well, we can eat peanut butter and jelly if we have to. You know, there were things like that to be able to directly. And, and it was that space and that time that allowed me to, to do that. So, no, I don't think it would have happened without the, the pandemic, which is sad, really, in a way that it, it, that it took that for me to do this yeah like this is the thing like nasa back in the day with its pathfinder uh probe okay now this is the thing being a pathfinder is one of the hardest things you can do and like you go like you you're setting the like you're going leading the way you're going through it all yeah. but like this is the thing it's one thing sending out a probe into space it's another thing being that pathfinder in life having like building those sort of blocks of belief in oneself is sometimes the trickiest things to do because look i don't look, forget the people on the outside of your life or the close associations, the little voice in your head, yep. which sometimes says, oh, if you, if you met a person what would talk to you like the little voice in your head, you would throat punch that son of a bitch right away. But nevertheless, it comes along, says all of this, and like most probably dresses you down in ways you thought. If, as I said, if someone said that to you in the real world, throat punch, what the hell yep. big you're doing? Yep, yep, yep. yep. I've Trust gotten to the point that if there are people that say anything close to that, not even that much, yeah. I always wonder what is their interior voice saying to them? Oh, yeah. You can only imagine if that's coming out of their mouth, what's running in their head. Yeah. And, and like, it's like, you know what? And I won't lie. It's most really like some dark messed up things, which honestly, if like, if you shut that voice out, which in some respects is trying to quote unquote, keep you safe. And like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, you don't need to push yourself that much. You can just like do this, play the safe game. Like, yeah. Just like one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, there yep. you go. No problem. But 
it keeps you from really sort of finding who you truly are. And I'm not talking about, oh, yeah, like, oh, this great person, this fantastic, oh, this next level. No, just like, just the person which you can like, you know what? I'm really glad I met you. I'm really glad I had that opportunity to sit down and meet you and like, yeah, yeah. help me find myself. Yeah. That's what that little voice keeps you from uh, many a time, you know? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I, I have befriended her more than I have gotten rid of her. Mm. Now there have been times where, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's going on and I have yelled at her to make her shut up. But I, but I think I've either, I won't know if I, if I foolishly, if I have officially given her a job Like, okay, you are hyper vigilant about safety. So let me give you these things to think about, about being safe. Or, you know, let me give you this to work on. Or let me let you critique how I put this together and whether I was safe. But the volume has come down a great deal so that we can have a conversation, almost like if you were arguing with somebody a lot and there's no way in the world you can talk to them we can actually have a conversation. She can tell me, yes, I am scared of all of this. And I'll go, okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. And because she feels heard, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. I hear you. And another way to sort of quell the voice within it's like, yeah. it comes down to, yeah. While you're doing that pathfinding mission and like, yeah, the little victories, which come from that, it's like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. it's like, yeah, but you saw that. Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. Oh yeah, you saw that. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh yeah, you saw that. Oh yeah, you're right. And yeah. then the little inner, the other inner voice, the cheerleader, or which uh-huh. like goes, yeah, you know what? You're damn right. You can do it. Yep. Like exactly. steps up and like yeah, takes like takes front and center stage. You know. Yep. One of the big ones is the 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 nagging of oh you didn't get that done. <laughs> and, and like you say, I'm able to say, Hey, look, I got all that done. Well, the other way I've argued with her, or I pointed out, I said, you know, when we get back around in that cycle again, if that is that important to you, we can make it a priority. And so I'm able to say, you are right. I didn't do that, mm-hmm. but it's not today's problem. But in two weeks, when we come back around to review everything, we can bring it back up and we can take care of it next month. And she'll go, Okay. You know, it's it's being heard and it gets addressed. I think I find it um, helpful to work with her if I can. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Now, yes. Now, you seem to be. How can I say you? You're like if this was Shrek, I go yes. You're an onion with many <laughs> many layers. It's like yeah. Now, with. Like in your onion life of like impishness and mischief, <laughs> and like yes, with a slight dash of order, what was the last most like what was one of the most memorable conversations you last had with her or with somebody else or oh, with somebody else? I think one of the interesting things has been because this has been so alone mm. and. My backers, um, everybody that was involved are people who knew me. And what I have found amazing, I I have a goal of, um, I published in August and I have a goal in the year from August to August to my anniversary, getting 50 podcasts out there. And I'm at 20 right now. And probably at least half of those, I have been amazed at the conversations that we have been having where people get me. I, and, they, and I'm like, these are complete strangers. You know, I have friends that I spend time with and they are patient, but they don't get it, which is kind of sad to me that they don't get it. But I, you know, the conversation you and I are having, I don't have with the people that are around me in my life, which is, I find sad. And I don't know if it's a whole thing of, of, um, too much is going on or, you know, they see chaos and they, they're not really sure that it's real or, oh, this is Jennifer again. We'll see how long this lasts or all of that type of stuff. But I mean, even like today's conversation or with Harry Turner, or um, there was another one with Ken Primus. Uh, it, it was, it was amazing to have 
conversations that people saw me and, and they were like, and it was instantaneous. They exactly knew where I was. And I was like, you see me really? Hey, if you had been talking to Harry, yes, he, he definitely will see you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and yes, trust me, he'll most really, li- no, he's not a therapist. He's a preacher. He'll lay down yeah. some, uh, yeah, like hefty words, like from his pulpit <laughs> many miles away. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they were very validating. And what was kind of neat as well is that they often told me how they were validated. You know, it was that, that it goes back to it's, it's kind of lonely to be in a space where if we want to call it awakening or enlightenment or, or pathfinding or path making and to find other people. And, and granted, it's not the same path, but at least to say, hey, I see you and I know what you're doing and mm-hmm. I appreciate what you're doing. You know, just finding each other, I think, is is um, connecting. Even if it doesn't really matter what you could talk about, it's just the fact that you see one another. Yeah, because like the reason why it's like sometimes lonely, because the whole thing is when you're taking ownership, you're taking leadership of your own life. And when yeah. you are in that, when you put your plate, like self in that place of leadership, it's a case of, yeah, you are now taking responsibility of what you do, what you, in, who you interact with. Like people often don't lead. They're quite happy to like follow the crowd. And if you're leading, finding your own path, taking that lead for yourself, for your life, it's like, I don't get it. Like why, like, yeah, you do that? <laughs> together, like with the rest of us. And then like, if you find like-minded people, which are also taking that, it feels reassuring that you are not the only one. And look, there are scores of people out there. It's just a case of you haven't found them yet. And when like you get out there more and more, you will find them and you'll find out you are not so much alone. You are in a different community to the one you once were in and like this is the thing it doesn't mean you leave that community it's just you found a new community you know exactly exactly and that may be back when you say what am I building to I think I'm trying to get my fundamentals together Mm. you know it's one thing when you have corporate and you got all that money but when you're getting your fundamentals together and what is it the hierarchy of needs then you know getting the relationships and i think that's 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 my next thing is being able to create space to go find that community especially in a pandemic you know there's only so much you can do and what you can do or at least with us that's where we're he- heading so yeah i hear you i hear you now yeah. hmm now <laughs> i have to say it's been a pleasure speaking to you I, 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 yeah, I'm like it's gonna have to come to an end very soon. I, know. I like uh, yeah. Now, if you could have a sit down meal with anyone through time, space, history, fictional, real, like who would you like to have that meal with, and what would the topic of conversation would you like to cover? I, I top of mind would be Da Vinci. And I would, I would put on my designer hat and I would do observation. I would, I would get a couple of questions going and then I want to see how he does things, you know, things, and I don't either books about him, but I make you bet there's so much that people don't know. I, I, I have a curiosity about, you know, what were his practices? How did he start his day? How did he end his day? Um, I understand that even down to the clothing that he wore, he was very particular about the fibers that touched his skin, which I've had other people go, oh, that's ADHD, you know, (laughs) but I I would want to, you know, at least spend the day, if not the dinner following him and, and um, just seeing how he does things and what he thinks and how he sketches and watching him put those, the chaos together. Uh, How he weaves the chaos together. Ah, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. Like, Jennifer, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to say it has to come to an end. I'm sorry. I, it is sad, but I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Oh, the pleasure has been all mine. You have been fantastic today. <laughs> hey, can you let the lovely people out there, the life warriors who are with us right now, where they can find you out there on the big wide world web? 
Absolutely. So jenniferpv.com is my website. Uh, my social media handle is at jennifer.theblacklab. And then um, easily on Amazon, uh, look up Natural Reflectors book and you will find me there too. Outstanding. Ah, uh, thank you, my lady. Ah, uh, yep. the impish one. Yes. <laughs> uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to you, my friends, my life warriors who've stuck with us so far. Uh, yes, please stay safe, stay well, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Have a great day, guys. See you soon. Yes. Peace. <laughs> and we are.